Praise the Lord. You may be seated then. We thank the Lord Jesus for another opportunity to stand up here and minister his word tonight. Praise the Lord. Well, the message last week was concentrating more on the relationship between the shepherds in the neo-discipleship movement. Because according to their teaching, one can not be counted a leader of others until he's willing to submit himself to someone else and first of all, be led. First of all, be taught how to follow before you can teach others how to follow you. And the truth of the matter is we agree with that. It just depends on to whom you're submitting yourself. Mm -hmm. Because their argument is that <clears throat> if you're not, first of all, submitted to someone else, then as the saying goes, power corrupts. Well, I wonder if you'll look over in Nehemiah chapter 5 to deal with that one more time before moving on to another point, the logical conclusion or the logical second step from shepherd submitted to shepherd would obviously be sheep submitted to the shepherds. But before getting to that, Nehemiah chapter 5 to answer this question about, well, does power really corrupt? They borrowed a figure of speech and they borrowed some terminology from the world and political systems to tell us that the higher you go up, the more corrupt you're going to be. Now that's going to be a sad spectacle for the Christian church if that's really true for the church. Amen. And what they tell us is it's most definitely true unless you keep all those who are going higher going lower at the same time by submitting to someone who doesn't have half the faith or uh, knowledge of the word of God that they might have. So that would keep them humble, in other words, so that power wouldn't corrupt. <laughs> Nehemiah 5.14. Now, Nehemiah is justifying himself before the people here because they've been doing things that if anyone should have had the right to, it would have been him, and yet he abstained from it, as you'll see. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year, even unto the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king, that is 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. He said, I've been appointed governor, but I've not eaten the bread of the governor. But the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people and had taken of them bread and wine beside 40 shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people, but so did not I, because I was under a human shepherd, no, but under the heavenly one. Power won't corrupt as long as you can say what Nehemiah says. I didn't use my power as a means of corruption among the people of God because of the fear of God. You see, these men who have to submit themselves to other men are simply saying they don't have the fear of God. Because if you had the fear of God, then you would be afraid of harming his sheep. You would be afraid since, of course, they're not your sheep but his in the final analysis. You would be afraid of exploiting them and using the power and the authority that you have for your own selfish personal gain. 1 Peter 5 verses 1 to 3 is another passage that says the same thing that we looked at last week, I believe. The elders which are among you, those who are in authority, in other words, those who have power. Now you watch all these examples and then answer the question, to whom are these people submitted? All these elders that Peter's talking about, Nehemiah. Who was Nehemiah submitted to? No one. Mm -hmm. He was the ruler of the land. He had complete jurisdiction over the whole land of Judah. He wasn't submitted to anyone. And, you know, it ought to be obvious to these men that if you've got the Spirit of God and you're a true minister, then you're not going to be corrupting the power and the authority that you have. If you do, it's just proof of the fact not that you need to submit to a shepherd, but either get saved or get out of the ministry, one or the other. Mm -hmm. He says, I exhort because I also am an elder, so I'm not telling you something that I don't have to do myself, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Now, he doesn't say, in order to keep yourself from doing these things and submit to another earthly shepherd. He says, I'm calling you to record on this because 
we're going to be a partaker, the end of verse 1, of the glory of Christ is going to be revealed. For he goes on to say in verse 4, For when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive some of this glory, rather a crown of glory that fadeth not away. He said this, in other words, is what should keep you in check if you ever have any desire to exploit the people or use your power and authority that you have for your own personal ambitions and gain. Nowhere do we find any reference to the fact that the only way you can keep sin out of your life, the only way you can keep too much money out of your pockets and so forth, which is what they're always talking about, is to submit yourself to an earthly shepherd. Yeah, one of them even said, you know, they tell us about, well, if you're not submitted, and I had someone in the meeting one time I told you about, want to know right away, who are you submitted to? Because they say if you're not submitted, then you'll exploit the people. But guess what? We were showing you last week, that's how you exploit the people. Yeah. Is you submit yourself to someone, and it makes you look pious in the eyes of everyone. Because if you're not submitted, it makes you look radical, and, they, and then they'll say, well, you know, no one's going to follow you because you look radical, you're not submitted. How can we ensure your competency? If you're not submitted to a college of elders, a board of presbytery, or something like that. Wow. And such can't be found in the word of God. No, because on the contrary, one of them said to one of their shepherds, who, by the way, wasn't even in the ministry. You see, shepherds submit themselves to shepherds. You all have to be submitted. Even the top four that were in Fort Lauderdale submitted themselves to one another. So there's no one on top. Not even the Lord, because no one claims to be submitting to him, just submitting to one another. And as one of the shepherds said to one of their shepherds, it was a disciple, but yet he was a shepherd over someone else. And just about everyone sooner or later gets to be a shepherd, unless you're a female, and someone has to cover you wherever you go. You never get to lead anyone else or have prophecies or anything that's independent of yourself. And he said to another, he said, I feel that, and he wasn't even the ministry, he said, I feel if you get in this area, I think there are enough people around here. I think you can collect probably 25000 a year. Okay. And that was way back in the early 70s. That's a lot of money back in the early 70s. I mean, it'd be like probably 50000 a day. And that's what his motive was. If you get in this area, I believe there are enough sheep around here. I think you can collect about 25000 a year. Said so that to one of his disciples. That's probably because that's what he was doing. Get enough people submitted to him. And if you can't find a whole lot of people, then just find some rich ones. I mean, wherever the money is. It's either in the masses or it's in a few people who are rich people. Then another passage, 1 Samuel chapter 12. To whom was Samuel submitted? He submitted to the king? No, he rebukes the king. Samuel's not submitted to anyone except to the Lord. But... As we see, that's not enough for them. 1 Samuel 12 and verse 3. I'm showing you all these people are who are in a position of power, and power hasn't corrupted any of them. If power corrupts them, then that's just what it's going to do. It's going to corrupt them, and you can leave them up to God. He'll take care of them. Amen. Don't forget old Elisha's servant. Went after the money in 2 Kings chapter 5. God took care of him. He said, you'll be leprous and so will your household until the day you die. Sure, he was in a position of authority. And if power corrupts, let power corrupt. And God will take care of those whom power corrupts. Amen. Verse 3, behold, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. That is the king who many times Samuel is rebuking, like over in chapter 15. And he goes on to ask, now where has my power corrupted my morals? Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith, and I will restore it you? And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us. Power hadn't corrupted Samuel, in other words. Nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that ye have not found all in my hand, and they answered, He is witness. Samuel didn't need an earthly shepherd. Samuel only needed to submit himself to the word of the Lord. And if ministers are doing that, then as we say, they're not going to need earthly shepherds to keep an eye over. Then over in Acts chapter 20 and verse 33, the testimony of 
the Apostle Paul where he says, I've coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Mm -hmm. Now, the only one who can really know whether covetousness is there or not is not an earthly shepherd because he can't read the purposes and intents of your heart. So how can Paul prove anything? Well, he can't prove. I mean, he might could prove that he hasn't stolen anything, but he can't prove he's not coveted because he might have coveted and never told. They just have to believe that God's going to watch after Paul and Paul's going to keep himself in subjection. No, it's not power that corrupts. It's an evil nature that corrupts. Mm -hmm. And if the evil nature is there, then that's witness of the fact you don't want to be under that shepherd anyway. You don't have to find out whether he's under another shepherd. You don't want to be under him because it's not power that corrupts. It's an evil nature. You see, you'll search in vain throughout the Old or the New Testament where power is corrupting one of the true ministers of God. And at the same time, you'll search in vain to find that the only way you can keep that from happening in their lives is when you find them submitted to another human shepherd because that simply cannot be found. It's an, it's an invention of 20th century charismatics that was prophesied by Paul here in the same chapter. And I think verses 29 to 31 would be good to begin with and go back over since we closed last week's message with it. Because we want to take a step further this evening in our studies of neo-discipleship and submitted body to go beyond the submission of shepherds to shepherds to the submission of sheep to the few shepherds that are on hand. Because you see, the shepherds have told us that Christians have been out from under authority for so long that the only way we're going to gain any discipline in their life is to get them subjected to earthly shepherds. And Paul says here in verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, the flock of sheep. And also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. We're going to have to stay with the Apostle John when he said in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether or not they are of God. He didn't say find out whether they have a shepherd and then follow them because that is really the only criteria. It's not, does this man know the word of God? It's always... Who's your shepherd? Are you submitted? If you're submitted to someone, then that's the criteria for us to judge whether or not you're worthy of us placing ourselves underneath your ministry and your authority. And that can't be found in the Word of God. The question should be, does this man know the Word of God? And so many of these that are in the shepherd position, in the position of being a shepherd, are so young in the faith that they couldn't know the Word of God because they like to put the younger ones in positions of leadership to keep the older ones humble. You know, they've got the whole thing all backwards, according to the Word of God. The Word of God says, let the older ones in the Word of God be the rulers, not the younger ones. And they've got it all turned around in an attempt to keep everyone submitted to everyone else and everyone walking in humility. Let's let the older ones submit to the younger. And this is not what we read over in 1 Peter chapter 5. It's ye younger submit to the elders. And you can see in the ages of a lot of these people, they're certainly not the elders, but the ones who are submitting are. And this is turning the word of God, turning the New Testament, turning 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, around backwards by getting the elder to submit to the younger. They say that because the Christians out there in Pentecost and the Pentecostal experience have not been under authority for so long a period, you know, through the 60s, no one was under authority. Everyone was just listening to the Spirit for themselves. That this leads to a wasted expenditure of charismatic energy. And you see, they're trying to corral the Spirit's force, the Spirit's power, by grabbing a hold of all of the wandering sheep out there and getting them to submit to not elders, but to the youngers. They tell us that the whole creation of God, the whole crea created order is based upon a system of authority. The Father is in control, and the Son is under the Father, 1 Corinthians 11, and the man is under Christ, and the woman is under the man, and the citizens of a country are under their governmental leadership, 
and then they keep right on going and the people in the church are under the shepherd of the church and therefore they get down to the talking about the church the sheep and the shepherds and then build a whole system of submitted body relationships of these interpersonal relationships between the shepherd and the sheep that follow him that follow him hence the nomenclature shepherdship mm -hmm. that's where they got it that's where we got it as a matter of fact because it's a whole system based upon this belief of authority that everyone has to be under authority and it's true that the whole created order is set up in such a way that someone at some place in some time has to be an authority but it's not the submitted body it's not the submitted bondage that is taught by neo discipleship in hebrews chapter 13 in verse 17 they have a verse obey them which have the rule over you and they use that for justification of beating the sheep over the head with the shepherd's staff obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you now let's make several notations about this verse in the first place Paul's writing to the sheep himself and because Paul's writing it ends up as inspired scripture and the sheep are expected not to be forced under the authority of their shepherds by the shepherds but to heed the teachings of the Word of God you see it's one thing we come along and read this passage and say now obey the passage because that's the Word of God and it's another thing when a shepherd comes along apart from Hebrews 13 17 and just forces submission on behalf of the sheep under his protection and care no, all of the sheep, if they are true sheep and they desire to be true disciples, are expected to know the word of God. They're expected to come across a passage like Hebrews 13, 17, and similar teaching is found in other places in the word of God, and submit themselves willingly to those that have the rule or the authority over them. In the second place, notice what he goes on to say in the middle of the verse, and the word for is the important word, the second occasion of the word for for they watch your souls no they're not watching your souls and that's what the shepherds do they're watching you and they're over your house every day to make sure you're doing everything right no you see pastoral care here not shepherd denomination for they watch for your souls you see this is pastoral care of the sheep it's like what we find, uh, I believe, over in 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter and the seventh verse, where Paul says, well, we can, we can start back up in verse 5. Mm -hmm. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. Well, here it is again. It's just found throughout the Bible. What does he say? My shepherd is my witness. No, God is my witness. He said, we haven't done any things, and my witness to that fact is God. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, but when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because ye were dear unto us. Now this is what the writer of Hebrews has reference to when he says, for they watch for your souls. They're not watching you and try to hit you over the head with the staff of shepherdship every time you get out of line. They're watching in a loving and caring sense on behalf of you. And then in the third place, the end of the verse, as they that must give account that is to the lord because it's the lord's sheep that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you see the writer doesn't go on to say well if you don't submit they're just going to make you submit anyway no they're going to leave you alone but when they give their report to the lord about you it's going to be one that brings grief and not joy 
is going to be one that's not unprofitable for you. Here would be a classic text to say, now, if you don't submit, they're going to force you to submit. But that's not what he says. He says they're watching for your souls because they know that they've got to give an account for you. They've got to give an account because you are the sheep of the Lord and because this is a ministry that we've received from the Lord. You see, I feel that too many of these people in the position of shepherds in the neo discipleship cult have placed themselves in ministry. And therefore, because their ministry has not been given to them of the Lord, they're really not responsible to the Lord for it. They've set themselves in ministry. Many of them are self-appointed apostles, self-appointed prophets, and so forth. Now, here's one who's not in shepherdship, but I saw it in a little uh, paper today where he's going to be at a certain church in a certain state, and it calls him such and such apostle and teacher of the word of God. <coughs> apostle, apostle and teacher of the word of God. And there he is sitting with four eyes looking at you. Now, someone who's sitting there with four eyes means he doesn't know the message of faith, which means that probably if anyone's put him in the ministry, it's either his best friend or himself. Yeah. It's certainly not the Lord. You see, they've got the whole thing mixed up, the people in neo-discipleship, and especially the, propagate, the propagators of this deception. They've got the whole thing mixed up because they don't understand the New Testament teaching on fivefold ministry. Because nowhere do you find ministers having to submit to other ministers. You don't find that, and at the same time, you don't find where the sheep have to submit out of bondage and fear to their local shepherds. Nowhere is that found. They go over to, and we will as well, to John chapter 10 and begin to take off with their heresy right here in John 10. So I wonder if you'll turn over to John 10, and we'll start looking at verse 1. You see, because they've built this elaborate system of shepherds and sheep, and therefore we've derived the name shepherd ship, they've got to find some justification for the shepherds being so important. You know, we read over in Hebrews chapter 8, I don't want to go over there and read it, just the passage that comes to mind, but we read over in Hebrews chapter 8 that in the last day, Every man will have to be saying to his brother, Know the Lord, but they'll all know me from the least to the greatest. Amen. That's what we're seeing take, taking place right now in these last days where the people who are true disciples and true sheep are all knowing the Lord and his will and his word from the least to the greatest. Now that in no way sweeps aside the need for fivefold ministry because the same New Testament that said Hebrews chapter 8 said Hebrews chapter 13. In verse 17, what we just looked at. So you have to take it all in consideration together. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. I find it interesting that many times when people want to go to a passage of Scripture to justify their error, it usually ends up condemning them. I believe if it has reference to anyone, it has reference to false religious leaders. In Jesus' day, it was the Pharisees and Sadducees. And today, the thief and the robber are the leaders of the neo-discipleship cult. Amen. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, it's always his own, it's always his own, it's always his own sheep. He goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger will they not follow. How do you like that? You see, I've got a promise right there. It's too bad it just is not working for everyone who claims to be a sheep out there. But I've got a promise that I'll not follow a stranger. Amen. Amen. A stranger will they not follow, they'll flee from him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what I believe is true of my life. I'm not going to follow a stranger. I'm going to flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now, do you remember we talked in this same series a long time ago, a message that one charismatic teacher has gotten from a demon, evidently, on the doctrine of illegal entrance and operation? Amen. 
where we use the same passage where he tried to show us that what the door is is physical birth. The only way you can gain entrance into the world is being born as a human, and that's the door by which you gain entrance into the world. Do you remember us saying that? Maybe you don't. You can go back and hear the tape because they use the same passage here, and what they do, they tell us the door is physical birth. That's what gives you entrance into the world so that you can begin to operate therein. And the neo-discipleship leaders come along and take the first five verses, and someone's wrong because they disagree with this particular charismatic teacher, and they tell us the door is your human shepherd. Everyone's telling us what the door is, and no one's reading verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am that door. It's not your human shepherd. It's not physical birth. You see, in the earlier message, what we showed you was that this particular charismatic teacher from Arkansas who's teaching illegal entrance and operation has seen verse 7, but he tells us that Jesus is talking about a different door there. Mm. One door is down in verse 2, and another door is in verse 7. Now, we proved that to be wrong by verse 6. This, well, the Greek is really not parable. It's a figure of speech or an allegorical message. The, this type or figure of speech spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. And so, just like in the parables, he goes on and gives them an explanation of what he said in the first five verses. Right. You see, this leader is telling us now the door in verse 7 is a different door than the door down there in verse 2. But verse 6 proves that wrong. Verse 7 is connected vitally to the first five verses because verse 6 tells us they didn't understand what he meant by the first five. So he tells them in verse 7, all right, here's what I'm saying. I'm the door. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. And we could say all that ever came after him are thieves and robbers as well. Yeah. And the sheep did not hear them. And for the second time, I am the door. Now, I said as we turn to this passage that it is at this juncture where they begin to teach their heresy by calling themselves the door into the fold and out of the fold of the sheep. They tell us what he goes on to say in verse 9, By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. You see, you are not even counted as a Christian without a human shepherd appointed over you because it's through this shepherd that you gain salvation, that you go in and out and find pasture. And that is why, dear friends, such bondage and fear is ministered to the poor sheep in this movement because they are told from this ninth verse of John 10 that if you ever leave your shepherd, who's your covering, that you've lost your salvation, you've lost any hope of finding green pastures, symbolizing the truth and the word of God and life and peace and all of the blessings of heaven. You have forfeited this in your life because you've left the door that gave you your salvation. Now that is heresy. That is heresy. That is heresy. Amen. To say that a human shepherd is the one through whom you must go to gain your salvation. Amen. So the charismatic teacher from Arkansas is not the only one who's been listening to demons lately. Amen. I think a lot have been listening to demons lately. Amen. I believe Paul said it this way over in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, That's right. giving heed to seducing spirits and to the doctrines of demons. Do you see if you believe this neo-discipleship, this upstart submitted body teaching, you have departed from the faith because the faith, the Christian faith, is you're saved by Jesus Christ. Amen. That Amen. is the faith, Amen. Right. not by a human shepherd. So 1 Timothy 4, 1 is being fulfilled in them. They are a part of those who have listened to a deceiving spirit which has taken them away from the Christian faith. Because as soon as you start looking to someone for your salvation, you've lost hope then. Amen. The Israelites were always wanting to look for someone, look to a leader. They wanted to appoint an, a captain over them that would lead them back down to Egypt again. Give us someone we can see. They had so much trouble following God. And Christians, it seems like today, have even more of a problem because they say, well, at least in the Old Testament, they had the, the uh, pillar of fire 
and the cloud by day and by night, and they were guided by that. At least they had a visible representation of the presence and power of God. And we Christians today, all we have is the Holy Spirit. You know, as though, as though that's inferior to the cloud of glory and fire in the Old Testament. All we have is the Holy Spirit. You see, I feel that the reason people are falling for this just left and right is because they're afraid to trust God themselves. That's right. Yeah. They don't want to have to make decisions for themselves. They would rather be turned into a little charismatic neo-discipleship robot where they have someone over them to tell them when to go out and when to come in. And I'll tell you what, people who don't know enough to come in out of the rain, well, they're probably going to be without hope. You know, if you have to tell someone it's raining outside when they're getting drenched, if you have to tell someone you're being deceived while they're being deceived, if you have to tell someone to come in out of the rain, they've got a problem. Yeah. They're being deceived. And at the same time, if you've got to prove to them that the sun is shining when it's blinding their eyes, then they in like manner have a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, I brought along with me this evening a couple of quotes from some of their tapes and from some of their writings. Now, here's what one of the shepherds said. This was one of the under shepherds you know you've got your top shepherds and then like each one of the four has 11 submitted to each one of them and then those 11 have 11 submitted to them and all the way down the line pretty soon you have what one of them had a revelation in 1973 about you've got a whole new religious movement a new denomination mm -hmm. and he says i'm young this is the direct quote i'm young i make mistakes if you don't believe me come and see <laughs> you gonna follow someone like that? Oh, sir. <laughs> I'm young, I ain't make mistakes. If you don't believe it, I can prove it to you. Come to my <laughs> church and I'll show you. I'm not gonna follow someone like that. And you find Paul making such negative confessions. I'm young, I'm fallible, I make mistakes to err as human. I'll probably fall by the wayside sooner or later. But stay with me as as long as you can. Well, this twenty three year old shepherd who, by the way, was not even in ministry himself, was appointed by his shepherd over four entire churches. I'm talking about the one who said, I'm young, I make mistakes. If you don't believe me, come and see. Appointed over four entire churches, and even his own employer was submitted to him. Which shows he wasn't in ministry. You know, he worked at a paint store or something and given authority, not only a paycheck from the paint store, but a tithe from all of these people. Wow. So he told one of his sheep, you see, he's under a shepherd, who's under a shepherd, he was, uh, it just goes on and on, there's no end to it. Until you get to the end and then you start back around in a circle. Mm -hmm. He told one of his sheep to underwrite his home for $37,000, so that if he didn't pay, then his sheep would have to. And this disciple said the following direct quote, this is wrong. I prayed about it. It's not the word of God, but I'll submit to you because you are my authority. Now that probably means that person's not even saved. When he says, the Lord himself told me this is not right. The Lord told me this is wrong. The word of God says this is wrong, but because I fear you, it ministers fear and bondage to you. But because you're my authority, I'll submit myself. You see, they go on to say, and the shepherds have to invent this little sidestep in order to get everyone to follow them, that you are to obey your leader even when your leader is wrong. Because God will judge your leader in the last day and you'll escape punishment if you obey. I wonder what about, we don't have to turn, we know the case, I wonder about what about the case over in Acts chapter 5, the first old eight or nine verses where we've got the case of Ananias and Sapphira now according to their logic I believe this is a passage that answers that teaching and that's the widespread teaching obey your leader even when he's wrong even when he tells you to sin because he's your authority you have to do everything that he says and God will not judge you but judge him in the last days so you don't have anything to worry about but I believe Acts chapter 5 answers this because here, according to their logic, we've got a husband, Ananias, who is the head of Sapphira, who's under him. He would be her covering, in other words. And they conspire together 
to tempt God to try the Holy Spirit and to keep back some money, in other words, to lie to the Holy Spirit by implying that they gave more than they really did. Now, Sapphira is submitted according to their teaching. This is the way it would work. Sapphira is submitted to her husband, Ananias. But guess what? She died just like he died. If you're supposed to obey your leader even when he's wrong, Ananias is obviously wrong, but look what happens to his wife, Sapphira. Amen. It's because she submitted herself to something that was being taught wrong and practiced wrong by her husband. You know, probably more women than men, more women than anyone, have, brought in, have been brought into all types of bondage by this teaching, where women have been told, submit to your husbands in everything, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Well, what about Acts 5 then? That wasn't very well pleasing when Sapphira submitted herself to Ananias. It would have been a lot better for her to say no, and if you do it, I'll tell on you. And even if she didn't, look what happened to him. God took care of him. And all types of problems have resulted in marriages because women are given no authority, no say-so about anything. They are treated as though they were morons who have no understanding, who can't listen to the Holy Spirit, who can't study the Word and grow on their own. And everything from what type of clothes that they wear to committing perverse sexual acts with their mate, they are commanded to submit. Yeah, there was one case of a woman who was asking another leader, well, my husband is requiring me to go to the racetracks and drink and bet with him. What should I do? He says, submit in everything. Now, that's not the word of God. Amen. Because we've got Acts 5 and verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. That is the principle that one has to keep in mind. We ought to obey God rather than men. Acts 5 and verse 29. But I can remember back, I can even remember back, if you don't mind me saying so, and if you do, I'll say it anyway, to the beginnings of this church, when I first became associated with, it, with this church, there were all types of little creep-ins here and there of women submitting to husbands in a form of neo-discipleship. And it wasn't until, I believe, last fall we finally told a message that at least attempted to clear up, well, where should I submit and where should I not submit? Because the Word of God is very plain on these matters. The Word of God teaches, and you have to understand the whole counsel of the Word of God, that you are a disciple to Jesus Christ first, second, and last. And that means no room for anything. You are a disciple of his. And if your husband is a disciple of his too, well, that's fine. Then you'll be following your husband because your husband will be following Jesus. You know, you have to keep in mind what Paul says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. What about following your leaders? I wouldn't follow my leader unless... He's doing what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. How do we ensure our shepherd's competency? Well, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Be a follower of your husband, wives, as long as he doesn't require you not to follow the Lord. You know, that ought to be so obvious. But I recognize that people are human, people need to be taught, because a whole lot of you were mixed up in a whole lot of areas about this one subject of which we have reference to, where women didn't know what to do concerning submission, concerning relationships, concerning their husbands, their spouse, their mate. Why? It's because of the influx of the teaching of submitted body and neo-discipleship. And if you just think back, You've probably been involved in it somewhere. Where did you get the idea of things like that? You were around someone. It might have been a friend, a charismatic acquaintance. Maybe you visited a church. Maybe you read it in some books or heard it on a tape. You know, tapes used to just be passed around all the time. Did you hear what this new speaker had to say? Oh, I remember that. Everyone wanted to hear everyone's tapes. Because they'd say, did you hear what this new speaker had to say? And it was this speaker and this speaker and this speaker. And you just went around and heard every wind of doctrine. If you're listening to that many speakers, that's probably what you're going to get. Amen. It's every wind of doctrine. Right. You couldn't get every wind if you say with one. Even if he's wrong, at least you only get part of every wind of doctrine. I mean, that makes sense. But if you listen to every minister, you're going to get every wind of doctrine. 
So hopefully that's been cleared up. We'll say more about that later whenever we get to submission, submitted body, and the, their teaching on covering, whenever we deal with what the Bible says about covering, both for males and females. But suffice it to say in preparation now that hopefully what we've said in the past has already cleared this up in most of your minds that submission comes first, second, and last to Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, they are making disciples of men. They are making disciples after their own selves rather than after Jesus. And without getting into all of the hypothetical situations on when your husband asks you to do this or asks you not to do that, if you would have taught people to begin with, Luke 9, 23, if you want to be Jesus' disciple, then deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him daily, then you wouldn't even need to get into all these areas and say, now, if he says this or he says that, because right away they're going to be looking to the Lord. What does the Lord require me to do? Now, you see, if you're doing that, people say, well, if you teach a messenger like that, encourages rebellion. No, it doesn't, because Jesus inspired 1 Peter chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 5 for wives to submit to their husbands. So no, that doesn't encourage rebellion or independence in their life, but it does encourage salvation in their life. That if they want to be saved, they better pick who they're going to follow and start following him. But are we really going to follow these shepherds who, by the way, it's interesting they teach a message on discipleship, neo-discipleship, are we going to submit ourselves to these shepherds who don't even believe the biblical message of discipleship? Mm -hmm. You see, if you're teaching neo-discipleship, it's not according to Luke 9.23. It's if you want to be saved, then find a human shepherd, submit yourself to him, take up your cross, and follow them. You know, they're really mutually contradictory of one another. You can't follow neo-discipleship and follow the biblical message of discipleship at the same time. You can only have one or the other. And that's why they are so opposed to what we teach on discipleship because it makes all of you know the word of God yourself so you can check out your shepherds, and they don't like that. You know, it's just like denominationalism. They like to keep you in the dark so you never know that you're being deceived. It's like the Middle Ages where people weren't allowed to have Bibles so they could read their Bibles and find out someone was telling them something that was part of church tradition but wasn't a part of the Word of God. And they encourage people, well, you really don't need to know what the Word says, because after all, I mean, if you really believe what they teach about John 10, there's your salvation, your human shepherd. Set your sign upon him, follow him. So they are adamantly opposed to what we teach on the message of Jesus' demands of discipleship rather than your shepherd's demands of discipleship, because it's going to take all their disciples away from them. It's going to turn all of them into disciples of Jesus, which is the only thing that's going to matter in the last days, Amen. rather than disciples of themselves. No, I don't think we should submit to those who don't believe or have the light that we do on discipleship and who at the same time don't believe and don't have the light that we do on the end time message of faith. Right. One of them has said that the faith yeah. message is a deception of Satan. Now, are you going to follow someone who says that all the times that you get healed and prospered by faith, you've been deceived by the devil? Yeah. Well, God forbid that people cast aside the blessed word of God, Hebrews 11, the whole chapter on faith, Praise God. Amen. under the guise of some charismatic teacher who's got a revelation that that's a deception of the devil. No, when they say, watch the one who teaches faith, I say, watch the one who says, watch the one. Amen. Amen. No, I'm going to watch the one who had a heart attack on June 12th of 1979 and then wrote a book and entitled the book, I Almost Died. Now, that tells you where their faith is right there. He's trying to make a big dramatic thing about it, and, and he entitles the book, the title of it is, I Almost Died. He just sold thousands of copies. Oh, he had a heart attack, and God raised him on the operating table. On the Mind you that, on the operating table, God raised him up. But then who entitles his book, I Almost Died. Now, that is really not someone who I think we should be following. No, because they don't believe the message of faith. They resist the message of faith. When they find out that you're attending someone's meeting who teaches on faith, then right away, you know, it's like the little black ball list. Right away, you get put on a black ball list, and... People are told, don't show up at your meetings. Amen. 
Here's what their teaching is on divine healing. Here's from one of their leading magazines. The title of the article is Doctors, Medicine, and Divine Healing. That's right, brother. <laughs> it's like faith, foolishness, or presumption. If you get anything in there besides faith, it's not of God. Or if you get anything in there besides divine healing, it's not of God. If we do find ourselves sick, then we should use whatever means medical science can offer to restore our health. Belief in the healing power of prayer does not mean disbelief in the healing power of medicine and doctors. This isn't neo-discipleship or old discipleship or anything. This is just being a part of humanity. It says go to the doctor whenever you're sick. I mean, my word, that's not old or new discipleship. That's no discipleship. That's just be like most doubters in the church. Belief in the healing power of prayer does not mean disbelief in the healing power of medicine and doctors. For the continuation of this...